This one's gonna piss a lot of people off, but it's the truth. It's the hard truth. I had a full field of study on this. Sources, description box below. Does NATO benefit the US? Now this, I, I'm living around a bunch of European individuals, even though I'm in a place called the American House, technically. But uh, this is gonna piss off a lot of people. By the way, if I keep looking off into the distance, it's because there's a, there's a goddamn yellow-eyed pigeon staring at me. I just nicknamed him Chernobyl, but he's always around here. Anyway, freaking me out. So if I look like slightly sketched out, that's why homeboy keeps staring at me. And uh, back, to the, back to the story though, NATO. Does it benefit the US? Okay. How many countries are in NATO? 30. There's 30 countries. Now here's a screenshot I found that I thought was really interesting. This is according to NATO themselves. The US covers two thirds of total spending and there are caveats that I personally will get into regarding that. Sorry, I should have read more of a quote, but that's like the big idea. I just want to save you guys time. Now there's a guy named Hugo Mayer. I don't know if he wants a shout out or not, but there's a shout out for Hugo here. I'm not going to misquote him, so he's not going to care about this. Hugo is a grand strategist. He's one of the best in the world understanding foreign policy, specifically NATO foreign policy. And he had conducted interviews with individuals who are in charge of NATO foreign policy, including a lot of German defense officials. I will not name who they specifically were, but they had all unequivocally stated that without the US, NATO as it currently exists would not be able to exist. Europe does not have the resources for that. Now, even though a lot of people say, well, the US is a big economy, we are able to contribute more. Well, there's caveats inside of NATO itself where each individual country is supposed to give 2% of their GDP towards military costs. That has not been met by our, our being US military counterparts, our European allies. And that is where we're gonna get into all of the problems. So I'm gonna read you a quote. This is, by, this is by NATO itself. In 2021, eight allies met the guidelines of spending 2% of their GDP on defense. First of all, I'm gonna stop there. Just eight out of 30. Okay, what, the, like, what a disrespect, first of all. We're contributing a majority. I'm gonna keep reading though. Up from just three allies in 2014. Oh, ooh, great. The United States account, accounted for 51% of allies combined GDP and 69% of combined defense expenditure. A lot of people like to say, well, the US has, we have military operations across the world that don't involve Europe, so we shouldn't expect the same thing from Europe. But at the same time, like I'd said, they're supposed to contribute 2% of the GDP. So here's what, here's what really bothers me about this whole situation. If the US military were to theoretically cut their budget, would we have enough to still be safe? Yes, yes we would. Did you know right now as, with stand, as it stands, the US has a bigger military budget than the next 15 countries, most of which are our allies. Also, this is also kind of a side tangent, but if we were to cut our military budget in half, we would still have a bigger military budget than China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia all combined. So that's what we're getting to the table. We're bringing this to the table. And the European allies just have to give 2%. 2% of their GDP, and they can't even manage to do that. A lot of which is just a lack of discipline and a lack of interest. They know that the US will stand by their side regardless. I find that is to be a little token of disrespect. For example, I think it's ridiculous that the fact that these European countries have these amazing healthcare systems and yet we can't get healthcare for Americans, we're busy going off and doing these types of operations. And now the funny part about this too is I've, I've brought the question to the supposed defense experts in Europe. I pissed a lot of people off. I raised my hand once and I said, hey, what is the benefit of NATO for the US? What is the benefit? I wanna make sure I get this right. So when I asked them this, first, the concept of debt came up. I'm not gonna name names. One of these supposed experts had said, well, NATO has a lot of economic benefits. And I said, what economic benefit is so great that it compensates for the US military budget that we provide, as well as the amount of aid that goes to Ukraine, even though we don't even live in this area. And they said, well, I mean, NATO holds a lot of debt for the US and they're willing to do that because they're allies. My response was, where does the debt come from? Mostly war. Okay, so they, Europe, 
they're enabling the U.S. to spend more money on war for them by temporarily footing the bill until they profit from interest. So we're, we're providing a nuclear blanket for them. They're footing the bill and then they're going to profit from the interest. So how, again, how exactly does this benefit the U.S.? Now, I, I love Europeans. Listen, Europeans, listen to me right now. I love you guys. You guys are great. But you also low-key hate us. You also take advantage of us. We shouldn't be leading. We do not make great decisions all the time. Look at Iraq. Congratulations to some of the countries for saying that we shouldn't be in Iraq. Congratulations. You don't want to be led by us. And we shouldn't have to lead you. That's the point. Okay, now here's another argument from the Institute for Geopolitics, Economy, and Security. So that's like the name of this supposed organization. Quote, Citizens can hardly get informed about the facts of economic progress that a NATO membership brings, as well as overall prosperity, rising living conditions, excuse me, standards, building infrastructure, better health, and education. Who is this referring to? Has any of this been benefiting the U.S., by example? For example, if we, let's look at the infrastructure. They just said it benefits infrastructure. Our European allies have the top infrastructure in the world. The U.S. has a C-. minus. Standards of living. A lot of European countries have increased their standards of living because it attracts investors. U.S. standards of living are decreasing. Some other people say, look, the investors are American. Benefits Americans. Haven't increased the standards of living. Might benefit a few American companies. That doesn't work its way down to the people. Perhaps a good idea is to have more redistribution, higher taxation like it used to be for these top 1% individuals. Maybe that's a better way to increase our standards of living than provide a nuclear umbrella. So if, for example, I don't know, I'm going to name a random country, Serbia. If Serbia gets invaded, then we have to get a nuclear exchange with a different country like Russia. And then we have to sacrifice Houston, Miami, New York City, etc. Maybe that's not the best way to increase the standards of living for a supposed investors who are pocketing cash that we're not receiving ourselves as average Americans. Maybe we should just have better taxation. So again, how are we benefiting as Americans? A bunch of Europeans have told me, these, these supposed security experts, that the U.S. is the world protector. And it is our responsibility to ensure that people are protected from other countries like Russia. I say, who the f*** says that we have to be a protector? The U.S. has tried to be a police force. Has it worked out? I don't think so. Does it benefit Americans? I don't really think so. So if you want to, if you want a protector, then why don't you guys go protect yourselves? I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I also don't think we're very good at it right now. I don't think our American people want it. And you guys hate us. So if you guys want help, could we help you? Sure. Sure. As long as it works for us. And right now, what we have with NATO, I'm sorry, it doesn't work for us because you're not holding up your end of the bargain. And we have a shitty deal to be in with, and that's also partially our fault.